Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Andrew Boga. I'm the Dean of the Chapel. And I think there's going to be three different introductions, so I'm going to be very brief and just say a very warm welcome to Maudlin. We are hosting this event, and it came about as Thea uh, was here for an interfaith dinner with our Jewish, Hindu, Christian, and Muslim students uh, for conversation and education. So a very warm welcome. There is tea and coffee at the back, and you're more than welcome to make use of that. And the toilets are downstairs, back near the entrance where you came in. Uh, that's it from me, but a very warm welcome to you all, and thank you very much. Well, my name is John Goldie Gay. Um, 20 or 30 years ago, uh, I was a participant uh, in a Jewish-Christian dialogue at Leo Beck College in London. And we agreed that we had to be careful about the issues we discussed and the order in which we discussed them, and that at least initially we needed to avoid some sensitive ones. The discussions were illuminating, stimulating, and encouraging. But then uh, I had to leave the group when I moved to the United States. Five years ago, uh, I moved back and I came to live uh, in Oxford, and I was glad to meet, perhaps uh, by divine providence, the energetic and visionary Thea Donnelly. Uh, as a result of that meeting, I became involved in the birthing of the Oxford Interfaith Forum in September 21. Seeing how it's grown, it's extraordinary to look back at the way a handful of us met and brainstormed about what we might do. Perhaps we might discuss the Psalms, we mused, and now there's a flourishing international interfaith group on Psalms in interfaith contexts. Only one of 12 uh, thematic international interfaith reading groups on art, sacred literature, <coughs> manuscripts, mysticism, philosophy, ecology, Eastern Christianity, eschatology, peace building, and science and religion, with enough offers of papers to keep us going for months. And this year, we have received His Majesty King Abdullah II of Jordan and the United Nations World Interfaith Harmony Award Award for Religion, uh, Literacy, and Peace. Let's discuss uh, inspiration in interfaith contexts for our first anniversary in September 2022, he said. It seemed quite bold, but we did it. And it has struck me from the beginning that there has been no hesitation about topics we might discuss. The participants felt easy talking about Abraham or Messianism or creation. It's meant that we can learn from one another. From time to time, a student uh, will ask me whether Christians, Jews, and Muslims worship the same God. And I always look at them quizzically and point out that Christians, Jews, and Muslims agree that there is only one God, and therefore we must be worshipping the same God. Unless one group thinks that um, the other group is worshipping something that doesn't exist. The background to the Leo Beck group in, 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 and the, the Oxford Interfaith Forum was not the assumption that we worship different gods, nor, of course, a Christian conviction that God had cast off the Jewish people, or that the God of the Jews is a God of wrath, uh, the God of Muslims is a God of violence. There may be truths about God on which we differ, though my impression is that I'm as likely to think that other Christian groups uh, seem to worship a different God, or at least have got different views about God. And there may be points at which one group thinks the other has things to learn. But interfaith dialogue presupposes that we all recognise that we have things to learn. And a striking feature of our Oxford Interfaith Forum discussions is the way that one learns things that can fill out one's understanding of God and of what it means to relate to God. And for that, I am grateful. Now, Dr. Alison Salveson uh, will introduce that speaker. Thank you, John. I'm very pleased to have been invited here to introduce uh, Gary Ransford, who's been well known to us in Oxford for some time. He's often had extended periods of uh, research leave with us and has given a number of papers, um, very memorable ones, and I'm sure today's will be memorable too. 
So just a bit of biographical information. He serves as the Blanche and Irving Laurie Chair in Jewish History, and he holds the rank of Distinguished Professor in the Department of Jewish Studies at Rutgers University in New Jersey in the US. His teaching and research focus on all things ancient Israel, which is a wonderful description, primarily language and literature, and also history and archaeology, which of course is very appropriate for the Dead Sea Scrolls. His secondary interests include ancient Egypt, the Dead Sea Scrolls, as tonight we'll find out, and the Hebrew manuscript tradition. He's the author of seven books, very impressive, and more than 200 articles. His most recent book is very easy to find online um, through Amazon and various other sites, Hendrickson in particular, How the Bible is Written, and it shows particular attention to the use of language in order to create literature, which is an approach that's not always taken with the Bible. In addition, he has produced two series for the Great Courses program, one on the Book of Genesis and one on the Dead Sea Scrolls. He also lectures regularly for the Smithsonian Associates, the One Day University, the Biblical Archaeology Society, and other adult education venues. So you can see he has a very strong track record in, in public outreach. He has visited all the major archaeological sites of Israel, Egypt, and Jordan. He's excavated at Tel Dor and Caesarea, which are both very important sites. He's also done extensive research on medieval Hebrew manuscripts at leading libraries, including the Bodleian Library here in Oxford, the Cambridge University Library, the Vatican Library, the Fisher Library in Sydney, and the Library of Congress in Washington. During his career, Gary Rensburg has served as visiting professor or visiting research scholar here at the University of Oxford, also in Cambridge, the University of Sydney, the Hebrew University, bar Ilan, the University of Pennsylvania, UCLA, the Getty Villa, and the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome. He's currently staying at Yarnton Manor for a couple of months, I think, and doing some research there, so he will be around for a while, which is wonderful for us. And it's a great pleasure to have him here, both in Oxford for the summer and tonight for this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Allison, for that generous introduction. And thank you to John for setting the stage for the Oxford Interfaith Forum this evening. And to our hosts, uh, Andrew, our local host here at uh, Malden College, and Thea, the director of the Oxford Interfaith Forum. Um, and I think uh, John used the word energetic. I think that's an understatement. Because if you go to the Oxford Interfaith Forum website, you will just see the remarkable number of programs uh, which are available, and so it is a great pleasure to uh, continue that tradition. Uh, I've given two via Zoom. This is the first time I'm doing one in person here in Oxford, so thank you all uh, for uh, your introductions and for uh, um, coming uh, to my talk. And hello to everybody who is uh, connecting via Zoom from uh, other parts of uh, the country and the world. The Dead Sea Scrolls at 75, the texts, their context, and the coalescence of Jewish and Christian scholarship. Big title. Uh, you'll have an understanding as we proceed um, how the uh, title informs this evening's uh, presentation. I want to begin by dedicating this lecture to the memory of Geza Vermesh, who was professor here in Oxford for most of his academic career. Uh, the number of us who remember uh, Geza so fondly, several of us in this room, Norman Solomon, Alison Thompson, they were, of course, colleagues of Geza, and I am so honored to have Geza's uh, widow, Margaret, here with us this evening as well. Thank you, Margaret, for uh, gracing our presence. Uh, Geza, as you can see from the dates of his life, died 10 years ago. Uh, it's hard to imagine that already a decade has passed, and in fact, it's uh, this season, it's 10 years and a bit, he died in May of 2013. And those are just two of his books, and the one on the left is the most important one for this evening, uh, because he is responsible for the standard English translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls, a volume that went through so many editions, uh, published by Penguin, still used, I use it when I uh, teach this course at Rutgers University, and on the right, you see his autobiography, 
with the uh, very wonderful title of Providential Accidents, and we'll return to that volume as well uh, this evening. Uh, some basic information. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, Qumran, etc. Uh, here's your map, and Qumran is located there on the um, northwestern shore of the Dead Sea, and you can also see from the map locations of other familiar places, Jerusalem, uh, Bethlehem, Jericho, and to the south, Ein Gedi and uh, Masada. Uh, Qumran is the site of where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. I'm going to give you some very basic overview before we get into, and most of you will be familiar with this information, but I'm going to give you very basic information before we get into the uh, in-depth analysis of the text. <coughs> and the scrolls uh, comprise a library of 800 plus manuscripts, uh, documents we should say, um, only maybe a score of them in any which way complete and the vast majority of them extremely fragmentary. Uh, they were composed during the last few centuries BCE and perhaps into the first century CE, at least the community itself existed at Qumran down to uh, 68 CE. Now this is the land, uh, this is the topography, um, as you travel east of Jerusalem, you immediately hit the desert, the Judean wilderness, and you also have precipitous uh, downhill drops to get to the Dead Sea. Jerusalem is 800 meters above sea level, and the Dead Sea is 1,200, um, uh, sorry, it's 400 meters below sea level, uh, the lowest spot on Earth, which means in a very short distance on a map, you are actually descending uh, from 800 meters down to 400 meters minus, so 1,200 meters very, very quickly. And these are the caves at Qumran. By the way, Qumran is the name of the place uh, as called by the local Bedouins who speak Arabic, and even the name Qumran is unclear what it means. There's a Wadi Qumran, which I'll show you. There's Khirbet Qumran, the archaeological ruin. We do not know the name of this place actually not even from the Dead Sea Scrolls and not necessarily from the Bible either. We just use the term Qumran. There have been some suggestions as what its ancient name may have been. So here are uh, some more of the caves. And this is the Wadi Qumran running, um, running right here. Where's my, here we are, running right here. Um, and this, by the way, is cave four, which we'll talk about. This is actually taken from the site itself, so you get a sense of how close the archaeological site is to the caves where the scrolls were found. And more of these caves. And here is Qumran Cave 1. And here goes our story. Now, if I were talking about some other subject, including the Bible, or let's say Homer, or Shakespeare, or Milton, or whatever it might be, I would not have to spend a good portion of my talk telling you how we know this information. Because the story of the Bible and Homer and Shakespeare and Milton and so on, it's just come to us naturally, never was lost to us. That's not the case with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and since the story of their discovery is so engaging and so remarkable, whenever I give a lecture such as this one, I always take the time to talk about how these scrolls came into our hands. So give me this 10 or 15 minutes at the beginning, and then we'll get into their contents. Um, cave 1 is so named because this is where the initial discovery was made. And you see here these earthenware vessels, which by the way were bespoke made for the housing of scrolls. Vessels such as this have not been found anywhere else in the archaeological record in Israel or elsewhere. And you can see the elongated nature of these vessels and the way the scrolls would easily fit into them. Uh, and there you see one slightly taller than the other and the lids and so on. These are the first scrolls that were found. And how were they found? Well, like many archaeological discoveries, quite by accident. Uh, this is um, Muhammad ad Deep on the uh, left, I believe. I've never sorted this out, actually. And his cousin, Juma Muhammad, on the right. And uh, Muhammad ad Deep, which, by the way, is Arabic for the wolf. They all have these kinds of nicknames. Um, it was out shepherding uh, the flocks, as the Bedouin in this region do, in 1947. So when I say at 75, uh, give me some leeway here, it's 75, now 76 years, but it's academic year 47, 48, academic year 22, <laughs> um, 75 years since the discovery. 
He was out shepherding the, the goats, and goats being what they are, one of the goats strayed from the flock and climbed up one of those cliffs that you saw there and entered the cave. Now, Muhammad, wise um, shepherd that he was, didn't go chasing down the gate. He picked up the goat, he picked up a stone, threw it into the cave uh, to scare the goat, and the goat would return to the herd. But instead of the thud of a stone, he related this story later on, instead of the thud that you would expect of a stone hitting the ground inside the cave, he heard a ping. And he tossed another one in and, and heard another ping. Now, inquisitive, he went up there, and that's where he found the earthenware vessels, opened the lid, saw the scrolls, and uh, the rest is history. Now, the Bedouin of this region speak Arabic. In those years, many of them, most of them, were not literate, even in their own Arabic language, never mind in Hebrew or Aramaic or anything else. Uh, so what um, the uh, young Bedouin lad did was next time the tribesmen uh, entered to Bethlehem, they would go to Bethlehem about once a month, they would trade their wares, and, which was basically wool from the sheep, goat skins if a goat had died, all the dairy products, uh, milk, yogurt, etc., and they would obtain what they needed. There's no real currency back in the late 40s. Uh, for these people, they would barter and pick up a pot or a cooking vessel or whatever they needed um, uh, in, in Bethlehem. And there they uh, went into the shop of Kando, somebody whom they knew. They, um, he has a real name, but everybody just calls him Kando. Uh, somebody with whom they had engaged in business prior. Uh, Kando was a shoemaker, a cobbler, so therefore he would buy the leather from the goat skins that the, um, uh, the Bedouin would trade with him. He was a Syrian Orthodox Christian, and he had two little businesses on the side. One of them was selling Christian, um, for lack of a better word, I apologize, trinkets to tourists and pilgrims who would come to Bethlehem. You see the crosses on, right there in the shop. And um, a little antiquities business on the side as well. Okay, there is no real law governing the trading of antiquities in those years. And gave um, the scrolls to, uh, sold the scrolls to Kando. Now, Kando, prior to this, had already made contact with, through other dealings, with archaeologists in what was then uh, British Mandatory Palestine, soon to be the State of Israel and uh, part of the Kingdom of Jordan. And so Kando contacted uh, the great professor Eliezer Sukenik, who was the founder of the Institute of Archaeology at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And he offered for sale, there were seven scrolls, by the way, that the Bedouin took out of K1. He offered for sale to Sukenik three of them. And Sukenik obtained them. Uh, what were the three scrolls? Um, a copy of the book of Isaiah, not complete, well, about a third of the book of Isaiah. And we call this the second Isaiah scroll. Um, and that, of course, was nothing new. We've always had the book of Isaiah. It was just by now, but at that point, by far the oldest copy we would have of the book of Isaiah. Uh, and then two new documents that Sukenik and no one else had ever seen before. The war scroll, which you see here. We'll come back to that towards the end. And the Thanksgiving hymns, known as the Hodayot. A little bit of information on how we catalog Dead Sea Scrolls. This wasn't created in 47 and 48 necessarily, but within a few years. Um, so the 1Q means Qumran Cave 1, as you'll see in a moment. Other caves um, uh, included scrolls as well. And then the letters, either a letter or a number after it. The really important scrolls get a letter. So M is the Hebrew word milchama, meaning war. So we call this 1QM. Uh, very felicitously, hymns and hodayot both start with H, and so this is 1QH, and so on, and so on. And you can see that these are quite long. This is 21 columns. Uh, Sukenik, by the way, this is where the story is just so engaging. Sukenik brought the scrolls, bought the scrolls, and brought them back to his home uh, on the 29th of November, 1947. Now, that should be just any other date on the calendar, but remarkably, it is the same date when the United Nations in New York was voting to accept the partition of Palestine plan, which would establish a Jewish state and an Arab state in Palestine. Now, without going into the whole modern uh, politics of this, but we'll get to there in just a moment, 
Um, as you know, the Jewish state was established, the state of Israel, becoming independent in May of 48, and the part that was supposed to be a Palestinian state was um, essentially divided between uh, Egypt and, and Jordan. But that was the UN vote. On the same day that Sukhenik was uh, probably posed for this photo at some later stage, uh, but that Sukhenik had the scrolls in his hand. And Sukhenik even noted uh, in his diary that here he was listening to the radio to the roll call vote that creates the Jewish state which would become Israel, holding in his hands 2,000 year old documents from the last time there was an independent Jewish state in the land of Israel. I mean, it's almost bone chilling, right? But this is what he writes in his diary. He was very cognizant at the time of um, what of the, of the coalescence and the, and the convergence of these events. Um, now, Kando held on to four of the scrolls and, for a while, and then he decided not to sell them, but to give them uh, to the head of his church, Mar Samuel, who is the Syrian uh, Orthodox Metropolitan in Jerusalem at St. Mark's Monastery. And there he is holding one of the scrolls on the right, and on the left, in all of his um, regalia, in St. Mark's Church, uh, which is in the old city of uh, Jerusalem. And um, my wife, Melissa, uh, who was here with us today, and I were just there six, seven months ago and took the opportunity of a brand new color photo of what St. Mark's Church looks like, St. Mark's Monastery. But you can see that this is where he's standing um, here, this is where he's standing in the photo to the left, not quite the same angle. Uh, beautifully uh, ornate uh, church. If you're ever in the old city of Jerusalem, I know there's so much to see there. Uh, the Western Wall, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and so much more. Uh, I suggest that you walk into St. Mark's if you're interested in Dead Sea Scrolls, because, of course, it's part of the story that we're telling. Mar Samuel, literate, but in his own Syriac language, a dialect of Aramaic, um, uh, gave the scrolls to scholars at the American Schools of Oriental Research. He gave them to these scholars to publish, not to possess, but to publish and make them Hebrew scholars and make them available to the public at large. Uh, the scholars who were there at the time were Miller Burroughs, the senior scholar from Yale University, serving uh, a sabbatical year in Jerusalem at this time, and John Trevor. And they set about doing the very early work of uh, publishing the scrolls entrusted to them by Mar Samuel. Um, this is high tech 1948. Here is John Trevor doing the first photographic record. And by the way, those black and white photos that he took are still serviceable today. And to a great extent, we rely on them because sometimes the scrolls have deteriorated just by handling of human hands. And in, not only that, but to my eye, I can actually read the old black and white photos better than I can read the color photos sometimes that we can take today. Okay, so there's John Trevor. Now, what are these scrolls? The first one is the great Isaiah scroll, the complete book of Isaiah. We call this 1Q Isaiah A. All 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah. Dated to the second century BCE. And if you think about the fact that first Isaiah is from around 700 BCE and second Isaiah is from the 6th century BCE, this copy is only four, five, six centuries removed from the actual composition, the authorial composition of this great prophetic book. Uh, prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, one would have to jump forward more than millennium. Our oldest copies of the biblical Hebrew books were from the Middle Ages, 9th, 10th, 11th century. So this was a remarkable discovery, pushing our manuscript evidence back so far. That's the beginning of the scroll. Uh, I would always like to take time to show you how scrolls are written. Three columns, usually, on a sheet. You seam them together over here, and you start the next sheet, or rather you have a sheet, and sheet, and sheet, and then you create the seam. And here's the end of the scroll. The last sheet only required two columns to complete the book of I say. Uh, the community rule, a brand new text, just like Sukhenik had two new texts, the War Scroll and the Hodayot, the uh, Burroughs and uh, Trevor team had several new documents that no one had ever seen before, entirely new compositions. This one, most important of all, uh, and we'll refer to it throughout this evening, the community rule. And there's the end of it again, look at the physical properties of how to write a text. 
And the third of the scrolls entrusted to the Azor group was the Pesher Habakkuk. Habakkuk, small little biblical book in the Minor Prophets, three chapters long. Pesher is a commentary style, which we'll talk about still. Uh, and it's a commentary on the book of Habakkuk, at least chapters one and two. You cite a verse or a half a verse of Habakkuk, and then you tell what its interpretation is. And if you have never seen an ancient Hebrew manuscript like a Dead Sea Scroll, I invite you in this uh, image in particular to have a really good look, uh, to look at how a scroll is physically written. First of all, the obvious Hebrew is written from right to left. But you can see that the, line, the, the sheet of parchment is lined. These are made from animal skins, parchment. They are lined, and notice the way the Hebrew letters are hung from the lines, right? In our system, we write above the line. I know none of us writes anymore on any line paper. We're all busy on our computer keyboards. But when we do open up a notebook to write, we, it's random. We write above the line. Uh, in Hebrew, you write below the line. Okay. Only the upper portion of the letter Lamed, in a few places here, uh, extends above the line. OK, and then the fourth scroll was too brittle to open. From the little bits that were visible, it was clear that it was a, something to do with the book of Genesis, and it dealt with Noah and Abraham. But it would take almost another decade before somebody figured out how to open um, the uh, Genesis Apocryphon, as it's known, uh, so that the whole text could be read. OK, those six scrolls, not the one I just showed you, but the six scrolls, Sukenix III and the Asor Teams III, were published very quickly. By 1948, 49, uh, 1950, sorry, we have uh, all of these texts available. And if you were in a library anywhere in the world, uh, Oxford, here, New York, wherever you were, you could purchase these, these volumes and start studying the scrolls on your own, only within two years, let's say, of their discovery. Um, now, by this point, back to modern politics, by this point, uh, Jerusalem was a divided city. Uh, on the west, you have the modern country of Israel and Jerusalem serving as its capital. And East Jerusalem, including the old city, is part of the kingdom of Jordan. And Israel and Jordan were at a state of war from 1948 onward. Eventually, they signed the peace treaty in the 1980s, uh, 70s or 80s. And there is Sukenik at his home in the Rahavia section of Jerusalem. And there is the Asor building in East Jerusalem. And there was no communication between them. A distance of 2.5 K, 1.5 miles. And there was absolutely no communication. So these two scholars were working, or two groups of scholars, were working independently of one another until their books were published when they could go buy each other's books from whichever bookseller had both of them. Now, that's all the discovery. Question, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? This was immediately the question that, that was asked and needed to be answered. Not the biblical compositions like Isaiah and others, but who wrote the community rule, the war scroll, and so on. Now, from this uh, more or less time period, we have the um, testimony of the great Jewish historian Josephus, who lived in the latter half of the first century C. And Josephus tells us that there were four main Jewish sects. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, and the Zealots. He also mentions, by the way, uh, the early Christians and uh, other groups as well, but these are the four main ones, and they are the, the, the sort of the um, very quick view of the panoply of Jewish movements during the first century BCE, first century C. And everybody started figuring out, OK, so are these Sadducees, are these Pharisees, are these Essenes, are these Zealots? Sukenic was the first one to see that they were the Essenes. And uh, other scholars quickly chimed in and agreed with him. And that's because Josephus gives us a very accurate description, I shouldn't say accurate, a very detailed description, we hope it's accurate, of what the Essene movement was about and how it was distinguished from other Jewish groups at the time. One, a communal lifestyle. They lived communally. Two, uh, to become a member, you had to go through initiation rites, as if it were some sort of a fraternity. Three, uh, they believed in predetermination. One of the issues, as Josephus tells us, that divided the sects 
was to what extent is, are our lives governed by human free will versus predestination and predetermination? Sadducees, all free will. Essenes, all predetermination, fate. Uh, Pharisees, a middle ground between them. Uh, and because the scrolls showed, as I'll show you, predetermination as a characteristic of this group, this is another point, bullet point that you see here on the chart. Next, uh, Josephus tells us that some were celibate, and by the way, the philosopher in Alexandria, Philo, tells us the same thing. There were marrying Essenes and there were celibate Essenes. And the community rule never mentions women or children. So this led to the Essene um, hypothesis as well. And Josephus also tells us that the Essenes were the strictest interpreters of Jewish law. And that came out in these scrolls, as I will show you. The Essene hypothesis was established early on. There have been challenges to it. There have been scholars who say, no, these are Sadducees. There are scholars who say, no, these are Pharisees. There are scholars who say, no, these are Zealots. There are scholars who say, no, there is some relationship here to early Christianity. All of those theories have come and gone, and the majority view remains, and it's the one that I, uh, to which I subscribe and teach, the Essene identification of the Qumran community. Now, the community rule. Let's quote a few passages to show you this. Uh, by these rules, they are to govern themselves, etc. Look at the last sentence here. They shall eat together, they shall pray together, and they shall deliberate together. Right? That is communal lifestyle. Um, you pray together, okay, a lot of religious communities do that. But the fact that they eat together, of course, is a communal lifestyle, which, by the way, Josephus also uh, mentioned specifically their dining habits. Uh, so this is the clue, this is one of those clues towards the Essene hypothesis. And for those of you who know Hebrew, the word there together is yachad. Uh, and um, by the way, that is their self-designation. I should mention this, okay? Sidebar, but it's an important one. The word Essenes never appears in these texts. In fact, the word Essenes never appears in any Hebrew or Aramaic text. We know it only from Greek texts like Philo and Josephus and Latin texts. Uh, so, uh, and we don't even know what the word Essene means. Again, if you know Hebrew, is the first letter an Aleph or an Ayin? Is the second letter a Sin, a Samach, a Shin? What is it, right? Uh, which in Greek or Latin would all come in as a sigma or an S. So this is a problem. We don't even know what the word Essene means. <laughs> Lots of theories. Okay. Uh, in column three of the community rule, all that is now and ever shall be originates with the God of knowledge. Before things came, come to be, he has ordered all their designs so that when they do come to exist, they fulfill their destiny, a destiny impossible to change. What is that? Predetermination, predestination. You are fated in your life, regardless of what you may do, you cannot steer from your left or right from your preordained destiny. And that's what Josephus tells us, as I said, about the Essenes. There are detailed initiation rites in column six. <clears throat> All of this fits in to the Essene hypothesis. Now, we have an independent confirmation from a non-Jewish source uh, from Pliny the Elder. Uh, Pliny, the great Roman polymath, admiral in the Roman Navy, naturalist, uh, travels the breadth of the Roman Empire from the Atlantic Ocean to the Dead Sea uh, as he is compiling the information for his encyclopedic work, Natural History. He's doing botany, zoology, geology, all of that. And he didn't go to the Dead Sea in search of Essenes, right? He went to the Dead Sea because he had heard that it's the saltiest water on the Earth. It is the lowest spot on the Earth. It's filled with all other mineral content potassium, magnesium, etc., and therefore he travels to uh, the Dead Sea. And between Jericho and Ein Gedi, he tells us that he encountered Essenes with no women among them, renouncing desire, by the way, desire in Latin, Venus, that's the word there, renouncing desire, the goddess Venus, uh, entirely, without money, and my favorite, my favorite, with only palm trees for company. 
<laughs> and if you travel from Jericho to En Gedi, how many of you have driven down the lake of the Dead Sea? There is nothing <laughs> between Jericho and En Gedi except for Qumran. And just south of Qumran, the natural spring of Ain Fashka, which is actually a green spot, where the Qumran community did some farming. Uh, or here's the Google map, okay? So, Jericho, that, that red dot is Ain Gedi. Uh, here is the little bit of green area of Qumran and Ain Fashka. There is nothing in that vast wilderness between the two. So he doesn't locate them, but he says between Jericho and En Gedi, we get a sense of where this was. And if you go there today, you can still see the palm trees. Okay, these are the descendants, I'm sure, of the palm trees that Pliny saw 2,000 years ago. Again, my wife and I spent fall 2022 semester in uh, Israel and got brand new photos of all the things that you see. Okay. Now, let's jump ahead with our story. Mark Samuel still owns the four scrolls. They're all published, I showed you the books, but he actually still owes, owes, owns them. In 1954, Mark Samuel moves from Jerusalem to where? My home state of New Jersey. <laughs> uh, to Hackensack, New Jersey, and, uh, which is the headquarters of the Syrian Orthodox Church of North America. With more and more Syrian Orthodox Christians moving to the U.S. and Canada, he was asked by his superior to, re, to uh, 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 move to uh, New Jersey to, a step, to be the spiritual advisor to the growing Syrian Orthodox Church. I teach Jersey. this at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. I always have a student who says, I was born in Hackensack. Well, that's because it's the large hospital and it's the county seat of, of <laughs> Bergen County in northern New Jersey. So he comes to New Jersey. And he decides to sell uh, the four Dead Sea Scrolls. How do you sell Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, you take an ad out in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> you can't make this up, right? <laughs> and it's in the miscellaneous section next to summer rentals, yachts, a factory, a manufacturing plant, and so on. Okay. Now, uh, he wants, it's better for him to have money for his church than it is to hold on to the scrolls, which are well published and photographed and everything. Now, the great Israeli, the young, then young Israeli scholar, Yigal Yadin, was on a speaking tour uh, in the U.S. in 1954 when the ad appeared in the Wall Street Journal. I, for a moment, don't think that Yadin was reading the Wall Street Journal, but someone called it to his attention, the ad. He knew immediately what they must be, of course, the four Dead Sea Scrolls. By the way, did you notice what it says? This would be an ideal gift to an educational or religious institution by an individual or group. I love you. And, you know, box F206, the Wall Street Journal. Okay. Um, that's how things used to happen in the classified section. Right? Um, so someone told Yadin about it. Now, Yadin, as an Israeli citizen, knew that he could not approach Mar Samuel, technically a Jordanian citizen, with the two countries at a state of war and obtain the scrolls. Uh, he was able to quickly raise the money from a philanthropic family in New York, and he approached his friend and colleague, Harry Orlinsky, of Hebrew Union College in New York, and asked Professor Orlinsky if he would go and meet uh, the intermediary that Mark Samuel had sent, where? In the lobby of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, because the scrolls were being kept in a vault in the basement. Someone has to make this movie one day, right? Because you can't know. <laughs> Professor Orlinsky was one of my teachers. Uh, every once in a while we covered a biblical verse, but mainly he loved to regale us with stories as how he posed as Mr. Green uh, in his cloak and dagger activity to obtain scrolls for uh, uh, Yegel And he did. Professor Orlinsky uh, did. It. Actually, Professor Orlinsky's work is more central to Allison's work than it is to mine, uh, working on Septuagint and, and uh, other ancient versions. But uh, whatever I learned in the field of uh, Masora, I know from Professor Orlinsky. Okay, what I didn't tell you until now is that Yadin is the son of Sukenik. They have different surnames because Sukenik, who was born in Poland, moved to Israel retaining his uh, Slavic surname. But the next generation of Israelis often took Hebrew names, especially if they were serving in the army, and Yadin had very quickly risen to general in the army, including doing a PhD at the Hebrew University in archaeology. So they are father and son. Notice the dates. Yadim obtained the scrolls in 1954, less than a year after his father had passed. And in his diary, 
notes how proud his father would be that the son was able to obtain the other four scrolls to reunite the original seven scrolls found in Cave 1, and they're all now housed at the Israel Museum uh, in Jerusalem. So those are the scrolls that I showed you earlier, reunited with the other three and in Jerusalem. Now, back to Qumran. If you find scrolls in a cave overlooking the Dead Sea, if you're a smart person, you would say, let's go explore the other caves. There may be more scrolls to be found. As my own teacher, Cyrus Gordon, close colleague of Howard Olinsky, used to say, if you find one squirrel in the woods, the odds are there are other squirrels in the woods. So this was the approach. Let's go explore the caves. Who knows these caves? Not these scholars sitting in their studies and libraries in Jerusalem, the Bedouin. So they cooperated with the Bedouin and told the Bedouin, help us explore the caves and you will be paid and recompense for any discoveries which they, which they were. And they explored dozens of caves along those cliff sides. Uh, eventually, 10 others, 11 in total, um, yielded scrolls. So this is where all the caves are. We will see in a moment the archaeological site of Qumran here. And you see the cluster of caves around there. Cave 1 is actually relatively north of, uh, what is that, about a mile north of there. And Cave 3 is even a mile north of there. But you see the cluster of caves around the archaeological site. Um, the archaeological site was, had stones already sticking up above the ground. Nobody had, had ever explored it. The local Bedouin called it Khirbet Qumran, which means the ruin of Qumran. Uh, and the, um, depart the uh, Jordanian Department of Antiquities, this was Jordanian land, um, realized that someone had to excavate this. And they turned to Father DeVoe, Roland DeVoe, uh, Père DeVoe, a Dominican priest in Jerusalem to excavate the site. And many of you may think of you know, Dominican and other Catholic order priests as uh, people living in monasteries and so on, which is true. But um, certainly those in Jerusalem, as I'll show you, were involved in biblical scholarship and archaeology, um, headed by uh, Father Chabot. Uh, their home is the École Biblique in Jerusalem, uh, absolutely wonderful institution. I'm sure some people in this room have been there. Only half a block from the American Schools of Oriental Research Building, which I showed you uh, earlier, and the best library for biblical studies probably in the world. Okay, right here at the Ecole Biblique. Um, this is an aerial photo of the excavation. Now, DeVoe determined correctly, uh, for all intents and purposes, it is a single period site. Uh, there's no layers like on an archaeological tell from ancient Israel. This is a single period from around 150 BCE, just the beginning of the Hasmonean period, for about 200 years until um, uh, the middle of the first century CE. And there's the Wadi Qumran flowing again. There's cave four. The photo I showed you earlier was taken from over here. Um, what's at the site? A large dining hall. I should tell you what's not at the site. No private dome sites. You excavate a site. It could be Pompeii. It could be Herculaneum. It could be a thousand years earlier at, uh, you name your favorite archaeological site in Israel. Um, you find pro private dome sites. Homes. Uh, there are none at Qumran. And that speaks to the communal lifestyle. They all ate communally. Now the question of where they lived remains a question. One of the theories is perhaps in tents, uh, perhaps in some of these upper stories, but there are no private homes. Uh, at one large dining hall. And off to the side of the large dining hall, the pantry. And we call it the pantry because in this room were found about 1,000 uh, kitchen vessels. Jugs, plates, bowls, cups, you name it. Storage vessels, serving vessels, eating vessels, and so on. They've all been removed in there now at the uh, museum. museum. Um, and a scriptorium. Um, why is this room called the scriptorium? Because in this room were found writing tables, although we're not quite sure that they actually wrote on these tables. They may have used these tables for creating the scrolls. How a scribe wrote in antiquity is a different story. Uh, but certainly in that room were found ink wells with the dried up ink still in it, which of course has now undergone chemical analysis. So that's why that room is called the scriptorium. And then a, a series of mikvaot, ritual baths. This is only three of the um, mikvaot that are present there. 
this was a community that was, I'm going to use the word obsessed, I mean that in a very neutral way, okay, they were obsessed with ritual purity. Um, when you do an archaeological dig, like I've done in Caesarea, which is contemporary with this, um, well, you know, overlaps with this at least, you find coins strewn everywhere, one coin here, one coin there, a few there, and so on. At Qumran, they did not find coins strewn here or there, but rather two pots, this is one of them, filled with coins. That bespeaks that communal lifestyle again. And when Pliny said they had no money, I mean, they didn't have any individual money, but obviously there was an individual there who was actually called the bursar, equivalent of the bursar in the Hebrew, uh, who obviously was responsible for ensuring the uh, community's existence with whatever needs they might have. This is literally the communal pot, right? right here. And the wonder of coins, of course, is they are dateable. And these coins date from the middle of the second century BCE, has many in coins, uh, to the, the latest dated coin is 68 CE, uh, year one or year two or year three, whatever it says, of the Jewish revolt. Um, okay, and there are the caves, and there's the site of Qumran again. If we go into the caves, we talk about cave four. Uh, this was the cave that yielded the most documents by far. Now, when I say documents, yes, almost 600 documents out of the 800 plus, all exceedingly fragmentary, because they were not kept in jars. When I say fragmentary, this is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it was the task of the scholars to put these all together again and create a semblance out of the disorder. All of them were brought to what was then called the Palestine Archaeological Museum in East Jerusalem, now called the Rockefeller Museum. The museum was built in the 1920s and 30s, uh, funded by the Rockefeller family of the U.S. And they laid out all of the fragments on these tables and said, start playing jigsaw puzzle and put them all back together again. And that was the task of the scholars at hand. Now, I love showing these 1950s photos, and my students are always amazed at these. Anybody have a problem with this photo? You definitely want the sun shining in on your Dead Sea Scrolls fragments, right? Okay. Especially when they're under glass and they're becoming even, you know, whatever else is happening. Okay, well that's not enough. We also have to have this, <laughs> because of course it was the 1950s, and this is what scholars did when they were sorting and cataloging Dead Sea Scrolls fragments. It is just amazing to see <laughs> what was happening uh, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. Uh, at that time. G. L. Hardy at work in what we call the scroll room. Okay, now, um, remember that throughout this time period, 50s and 60s, uh, Sukhenik passes away, Yadin is there in West Jerusalem, living in Rakhavia, and Devoe is in East Jerusalem, Jordanian, there is that white strip that you see in the middle of um, no man's land governed by the, with United Nations forces. And you had no communication between East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem with the state of war. Again, the same 1.5 miles separating these two great scholars who could not communicate with one another. Where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, Gaze of Ramesh tells us in his memoir, Providential Accidents, I'm not sure if it was the first time he revealed this or this came out earlier. He tells us that in the 1950s, uh, he was still in Paris at the time. Uh, he was born in Hungary, by the way, as you probably can tell from his uh, name. Uh, he was in Paris as a young scholar before he came to England. Uh, but he was at a conference in Cambridge, and there he met DeVoe and Yadin. So DeVoe and Yadin would actually meet at conferences, but they lived a mile and a half from each other and couldn't communicate with one another. And in his memoir, he writes, um, I recognize, I'm about a third of the way down, I recognize one of the speakers uh, from the photographs I had often seen in the Israeli newspapers during my stay in Jerusalem was Yadai Yadin. We had a very friendly chat. At the end of which I agreed to act as his Paris letterbox for his correspondence with Father DeVoe and other Qumran scholars in Jordan. So do you know what happened? 
Defoe would post a letter from Jordan to Paris, and Professor Vermesh would repost it back to Yadin in Jerusalem. They could probably could have shouted to one another or used paper airplanes, but no, they had to do this postal thing. Thank you. A little known story about the great case of Vermesh. Uh, and you see my red Google dot there showing where Oxford is, because of course after Paris he came to England first, Newcastle, and then Oxford. Uh, as long as we are here, I also need to mention the great GR driver. Everybody see on the left, honorary fellow of Magdalen College. Um, Andrew, you'll have to explain to me what an honorary fellow is, because he spent his entire academic career here for 50 years. It wasn't quite honorary. I think he was actually just a fellow of Magdalen, mm -hmm. but these are some of the uh, mystifying titles that bewilder Americans like myself. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, the great Professor Driver uh, here in uh, Oxford was also engaged in Dead Sea Scrolls scholarship and his very important book, uh, The Judean Scrolls. He, by the way, um, um, posited the zealot hypothesis, which almost nobody subscribes to, but he really makes a very good argument for it. So I also wanted to mention not just Gaza Vermesh, but also GR. Okay, once all the scrolls have been found, uh, this pie chart reveals about a fourth of them were biblical scrolls, but the largest chunk are what we call sectarian scrolls, like the community rule. Scrolls that really speak to the beliefs and practices of the community. Every biblical book is represented there, with the exception of Esther, no copies from, of Esther. You can see that the three most popular books, no surprise, Psalms, which probably they recited, Deuteronomy and Isaiah. Um, everybody wants to know, are these biblical books the same as the Bibles we use today? And in some cases they are. In fact, the second Isaiah scroll, of which we have only a third, matches up with the medieval Masoretic text quite closely. But this was a time of textual fluidity. There is no unified biblical text yet. And even in the Middle Ages, there probably never really is one, not in Hebrew, not in Greek, not in Latin. Remember, scribes did what they did, and not really until the age of printing do you have a fixed text of anything. Bible, Homer, it doesn't matter. Old Testament, New Testament, it doesn't matter. So, just to give you one example of textual fluidity, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, very famous passage, which I've written on the top. Um, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Uh, um, etc., uh, the word holy three times, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. In the Isaiah scroll, 1Q Isaiah A, only twice, kadosh, kadosh. Hmm. This doesn't change the world dramatically, but it shows you textual fluidity. And since this verse is quoted in Jewish and Christian liturgy regularly, if you find the church or synagogue service a little bit too long, here is your ancient <laughs> license to delete one of the kadosh recitations, and you can leave the service just a little bit earlier on Saturday. <laughs> okay, they're all in the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem. And we return to the Essenes, and let's go into this greater detail. Uh, as Josephus said, they had a greater, um, a stricter interpretation of Jewish law, right? Let me. Uh, um, Explain this. All Jews could agree on one thing. Hard to imagine. All Jews could agree on one thing, right? The Torah is the word of God. The only question is, how do you interpret it? Some will interpret the legal material more liberally, some more st strictly, and so on and so forth. How far, everybody agrees that you have to observe the Sabbath, and you cannot travel on the Sabbath. How far can you walk on the Sabbath before your little walk is no longer just a walk, but it's actually travel. And so the Qumran community says 1,000 <laughs> cubits. The rabbinic law, which we assume is preceded by the Pharisaic tradition, says 2,000 cubits. In other words, you have a stricter interpretation at Qumran. You can only walk 1,000 cubits uh, on the Sabbath day. Beyond that, on the Sabbath, you cannot cook. And therefore, all food must be prepared, all cooked food must be prepared on Friday. In fact, if you know your Gospels in the New Testament, Friday is referred to as the day of preparation. Uh, the Qumran community went further. They did not 
prepare, they also prepared even the uncooked food on Friday. Now what that meant, unclear. Uh, if you were a Jew and you wanted to have a date or a fig on Saturday lunch, I assume you would just open your vessel and take out your dates and your figs, the equivalent of making a salad today or a sandwich. None of that requires cooking. But the Qumran community apparently prepared all their food on Friday, not just the cooked food, but even the uncooked food. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go into all of these details, but you can see that the Qumran community, again, is stricter in its legal positions than the, by comparison, the rabbinic law, which is about a century or two after this. Um, one more scroll was still to be discovered, or still to be had. Kando continued to hold on to a scroll called the Temple Scroll. In 1967, when Israel um, um, gained control of East Jerusalem and the area which includes Qumran as well, during the Six Day War, uh, Bethlehem was now under Israeli control. General Yadin, still serving in the army, sent his men to Kando's shop and said, where is that other scroll? <laughs> and they took it. Kando was compensated. He just didn't take it. He was, he, he, they obtained it from him. And then Yadin spent 10 years before he published in 1977 um, what we call 11QT, the Temple Scroll, the longest scroll of all, which gives us the Essene understanding as to how the temple should be run in Jerusalem. We don't like the way the Pharisees and Sadducees are doing things, whichever of them had control. This is their vision for the temple. Now, again, a very complicated law, but let me explain. According to, most likely, both Pharisees and Sadducees, if you want to bring some sort of a foodstuff to the temple, let's say you're a great, uh, you're, you're a vintner in the Galilee, or you have an olive orchard in the Galilee, or whatever, you want to bring your olive oil, or your wine, or whatever it is, you just get a, a, you can't put it in a vessel, the vessels are too heavy, not even a donkey can carry them such a distance. You put them in animal skins, right? The kinds of, that the Bedouin carry their little skin bottles, and um, you convey them to Jerusalem that way. Fine. The Essenes believe the purity of the temple would become impure if you conveyed wine or olive oil in an animal skin from an animal that died, let's say, up there in the Galilee somewhere you would have to journey to Jerusalem, obtain an animal skin produced from an animal that was slaughtered in the temple rituals, carry the empty skin back to your home, fill it with olive oil, and come back again. Two journeys. Everybody understand this? That's a stricter view of Jewish law. Right? And it puts an imposition on the farmer. But if you don't follow this, they believe the temple was impure. Now, Josephus tells us, I didn't mention this earlier, that the Essenes did not sacrifice, but he doesn't tell us why. In other words, all the Jews were engaged in temple rituals. The Pharisees may not agree with the way the Sadducees did things. The Sadducees may not agree with the way the Pharisees did things, and we have same sources that refer to this. But the other group, whoever was on the out, was able to at least participate in some way it's not the way I would do it, but worship of God in the temple is more important for the unity of the Jewish people. The Essene community side decided we can't go there. We have to remove ourselves from those temple rituals. After all, the whole temple is now impure because we've been bringing wine and olive oil and all of our other foodstuffs to the temple in, an, in a prohibited fashion. How do you retain your holiness? If the holiness is to be found in the temple, how do you retain your holiness? There is a fragmentary Qumran text, 4Q174, known as the Floralabium. And in a brilliant leap, a brilliant theological leap, the community at Qumran refers to itself as the Mikdash Adam, a sanctuary of men. In other words, humans. In other words, Mikdash sanctuary is usually the temple in Jerusalem. But if we're not participating in that temple, we ourselves become the Mikdash. We become the holiness. <clears throat> and that is this remarkable theological leap in this Dead Sea Scroll text. And this is where we begin to tie it into early Christianity. 
Because in John chapter 2, when Jesus famously says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, he doesn't mean that he's going to rebuild the physical temple in three days. Christian exegesis has always understood this to mean right, that the new community of Christianity is what's going to be the temple, the sanctuary. And so you can see similar theological approaches between the Essene community and early Christianity. Now, uh, ritual purity. According to the book of Leviticus, uh, you become impure through a series of means, many of them beyond your control. Uh, menstrual, uh, menstruation for a woman, nocturnal emission for a man, um, uh, skin diseases, childbirth, and according to Numbers chapter 19, when you bury the dead, what we call corpse impurity. These are all acts that you do sometimes involuntarily, sometimes voluntarily for good, like childbirth and burying the dead. There are no greater acts of human kindness, uh, loving kindness, than we can do as humans. The Qumran community, which is to say there's nothing between good and evil related to purity and evil. The Qumran community blended the two. And they state in the community rule, um, None of the perverse men is to enter the purifying waters, the ritual bath, uh, and so contact their purity. Indeed, it is impossible to be purified without first repenting of evil. In other words, purity and impurity issues are blended with good and evil issues. In Mark, and elsewhere in the Gospel, Mark chapter 1, verse 4, John the Baptist uh, preached a baptism of forgiveness and a repentance of sins. Sorry, baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, scholars used to read this and say, prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, where did John the Baptist get this idea from? This isn't Jewish. You immerse yourself in the water to remove your impurity because you buried your relative, because a woman gave birth, whatever it might be. You don't do this for the forgiveness of sins. There are other mechanisms for that, but not bathing in the waters. Where does John the Baptist get this idea from? It is a Jewish concept. It's just that we didn't know that. We now know it is through the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So when John the Baptist goes out into the wilderness, where is he going? The Google map will help us even more so. There's Jericho, there's Qumran, and that's the traditional baptismal site of Jesus along the Jordan River, just a mile or two before it empties into the Dead Sea. Uh, forget all those settlements along Route 1, there's nothing there, right? This is just an empty wilderness until you get to the Jordan River Valley back 2,000 years ago. So when John goes out into the wilderness, wherever he is, to baptize people in the Jordan River, as I like to say, we don't know if he stopped at Qumran for lunch, <laughs> but he certainly was in the area. And so the geography and the theological and the practical all come together, converge to suggest that indeed there is a continuity or a connection between what you see at Qumran and what we learn about John the Baptist. Now, uh, the pressure system. Uh, here's a famous verse. In Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4, uh, the righteous man by his faith shall live. That's the passage, three words in Hebrew. And then the commentary says, this refers to all those who obey the law, etc., because of their suffering and their loyalty to the teacher of righteousness. Who's the teacher of righteousness? He's the leader of the sect, or at least the founder of the sect. We don't know that he had a replacement. He was the founder of this group. In other words, the righteous... It's not the righteous human, you, me, whomever, but rather the righteous one is the teacher of righteousness, and it is only through him that you can gain salvation. Uh, the book of Habakkuk is 600 years old, but it's speaking to the present. That's the Pesher interpretation. And that's what the gospel writers are doing. They take biblical verses that are 600, 700 years old, but they have them speak to the first century to the events of their day, the life of Jesus. And Paul famously, I don't know whether Paul wrote these three books, these three letters or not, but we'll call him Paul, 
Paul famously, traditionally Paul, famously in Romans, in Galatians, and in Hebrews, quotes the same verse from Habakkuk. You begin to see the interconnections between the Dead Sea Scrolls and early Christianity. The war scroll, an apocalyptic, cataclysmic battle in which the forces of good will destroy the forces of evil, known as the sons of light and the sons of darkness. And by the way, the expression sons of light occurs in the Gospel of John. If you can read Hebrew, I always like to point out B'nai Or, B'nai Choshech, and B'nai Or again. This kind of an apocalyptic ties into early Christianity, seen especially in the final book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. The upshot of all this is that Qumran slash Essene ideas <clears throat> percolate into early Christianity. We don't we are not able to connect the dots, but when you see ap apocalyptic visions, Pesher method of interpretation, Habakkuk 2 4 cited three times, John the Baptist's idea of using the immersion in water for the forgiveness of sins and, and, and uh, evil acts, all of those are attested now with Qumran. Prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we didn't know this. And early Christianity just sort of was there as an outlier. We all knew it was Jewish. And by the way, scholars already in the 19th century suggested some connection to the Essenes. But we could not connect the dots. The Qumran community has brought early Judaism and early Christianity closer than ever before. We now know where the roots of Christianity are. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say they were an Essene group. They were not. But they shared major ideas with the Essene community whose voice has come to light through the Dead Sea Scrolls. Final point, what happened to the Essenes? Some of their ideas are still around in the Middle Ages amongst various Jewish groups, including probably the Karaites, but that's a lecture for another time. Thank you.